Today's episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSense, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free trial at www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co slash PMC. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. Do me a quick favor. If you like what you hear at Planet Microcap, please take two seconds and give us five stars on Spotify or Apple. This helps with the search engine so that more folks can also discover and engage with all things microcaps. Registration is now open for our next event, the Planet Microcap Showcase, taking place in Las Vegas at the Horseshoe Hotel and Casino, formerly Bally's, on April 25 through 27, 2023. Expect three days of networking, company presentations, one-on-one meetings, in short, a lot of fun. If you follow our community and especially invest in microcap stocks, you're not going to want to miss this. Expect more announcements on speakers who may be there to pitch a few names, as well as the presenting company list. To register and attend, please visit www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vegas. Now for today's show, I invited back on Adam Wilk, founder and portfolio manager of Greystone Capital Management. It's still January, so it's still time to reflect on the year that was. And so we did just that. And last time I had Adam on, it was about four years ago. And since then, his fund has grown as well as his experience as a microcap investor. We jam on a few topics here today. What worked for him in 2022, specifically business doing accretive M&A, which we will get into more, and activist involvement. What didn't work in 2022, managing mental and emotional side of investing, especially in a year like 2022, capital raising in this environment, and positioning himself heading into 2023. Speaking to the headline of today's show, we also discussed why his investment in Polish.com has, and I quote here, been one of the more frustrating investments I've ever made, end quote, and the idea of frustrating investments in general. Thank you again for tuning in to Planet Microcap Podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Adam Wilk. This episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSets. You can find them at streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co backslash PMC. Stream is an expert interview transcript library that is starting to become an integral part to investors' research process. They have a number of interviews on a wide variety of companies, including TMT, consumers, industrials, real estate, and more. Stream provides over 300 expert interviews per week, and 70% of their experts are found exclusively on Stream. Stream is unlike any other transcript libraries. Stream integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Stream's community of experts and thought leaders partner with Stream to build their professional brands and expand their industry influence. Right now, there are approximately 8,500 plus call transcripts available. For more information, please visit www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co backslash PMC. Adam, thank you for joining me today, man. How you doing? Great. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely, dude. I, I was just checking in our archives, man. It's been I guess almost four years, three and a half years since you were first on. We were talking about, uh, you know, your 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 time at the Spurs and and all that stuff. So I mean, real quick, catch me up, man. How's everything going? It's great. Yeah, way too long. Uh, I I love the show and listen to it every week. So really appreciate you uh, having you. me back on. Um, yeah, life is uh, life is good and been busy um, trying to grow the firm and um, 
my my wife and I had a, a child a year and a half ago ish, and uh, so that's been keeping us busy. And um, but yeah, you know, moving forward as usual and trying to digest uh, all the craziness that happened in markets last year. To say the least, but you know, above all else, congrats on that, man. We were thank you, thank you. The, the new dad club, I love it. We should start a whole <laughs> thing, the microcap dad club, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm in. You can be the captain. Yeah, right. It's good. That- <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk. Let's talk. Last year, um, you know, we're we're recording this on uh, January 12th. You know, we're still rel- obviously we're in the new year. It's very early, you know, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of interviews to kind of talk about that experience in 2022 for folks for if they find this interview later down the road or even a year from now, when we're reflecting on 2022, which was a tough year for literally almost every active investor or even passive investor. Um, so, I mean, for you, let, let's start with let's what what worked in 22 and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so the short answer is not much. Um you know, in terms of what worked last year, if you weren't in energy or commodities, uh, probably very little. We had some things that worked well, um, single securities that didn't decline as much as the broader market, um, you know, but being overweight consumer facing businesses was really tough. Um, I'd say for me, what worked was businesses doing accretive M&A, growing free cash flow and some merger related stuff, as well as businesses with activist involvement. We owned uh, Houghton Mifflin, uh, HMHC, for example. Uh, they're no longer public, so um, there's no disclosure there. But that was one of our largest positions heading into the year, and that was acquired um, for a decent premium. So that was a big winner early on in the year, which is really helpful um, in terms of total returns. And then, um, as I was saying, M&A is pretty helpful in an environment like this, I think, just because, especially where the strategy is already funded, because um, the timing and size of deals is unpredictable. And for companies acquiring from the private markets, valuations may come down during periods like last year. And this can obviously work both ways if you're public and you try and use your stock as currency. But I like the unpredictability part of it because a strong deal can come through as the market is selling off and it can sort of prop up that company's share price. And so among other things, we had one company that fit that mold that was up quite a bit during 2022. M&A is not all they do, but that was um, very helpful from a portfolio standpoint. And then um, we also own a few other micro caps between 60 million and 350 million market cap that are very tightly held or just too small for larger funds to own. And so those typically don't sell off that hard uh, in my experience. You know, when you're 30 to 40 to, to even 70 percent inside our own, you know, nobody is really selling the stock down that much. Um, And then, you know, some things that held up well during the end of the year and kind of rallied a little bit consisted more of catalyst driven situations with really huge margins of safety and downside protection, things that I think where where the management team is taking steps to unlock value in a specific segment or for the entire business, or where there's a lot of, um, I guess, hidden value on the balance sheets. Um, Those things were up on the year or, or didn't sell off that much, which was helpful. Um, and then, you know, those were offset by general market declines that affected the rest of our holdings, as well as one security in particular, Polish.com, which full disclosure, we still own that uh, sold off very hard and um, don't have to go into all the details of that right now, but those are, those are the things that worked with the exception of Polish. Those are the things that worked pretty well for us last year. For sure. And I'll, I'll have a question on Polish specifically in, in a little oh, bit, sure. right? but, but I mean, also then conversely, I mean, for you and your process, what didn't work for 2022? Yeah. So, um, the answer to that is a lot, you know, the first short answer was a little, now this one's a lot. Um, unfortunately, you know, there were times last year when all businesses were treated the same regardless of quality and kind of discarded as risky or unsafe. And I think, um, you know, uncertainty, the market hates uncertainty and uncertainty in the short term can be really scary. And because we typically own businesses that have kind of stronger multi-year outlooks than multi-month outlooks, sometimes the multi-year outlook can kind of move further and further out of focus as everyone is really concerned with like the here and now. And as a concentrated long only strategy, you know, overweight positions and consumer uh, related businesses, um, it wasn't surprising that it was a difficult year. You know, I'm 
we're not involved with any high growth, unprofitable SaaS businesses or any technology related things at the moment. So we sort of sat on the sidelines and watched, you know, that dramatic multiple compression take place um, among those uni that universe of companies. Um, but there is also multiple compression in our portfolio as well, despite really strong business execution, which was very frustrating. And so we, you know, I found myself up against a situation where the cheap got cheaper. Um, you know, anything, whether we owned it or not, anything deemed tied to like the real economy really struggled last year. Um, anything consumer related, as I mentioned, um, I think consumer discretionary stocks were, were down something like 35% as a whole for 2022 or something crazy like that. I think it was one of the worst performing sectors. Um, toward the end of the year, we started building a bucket of cannabis related businesses that sold off incredibly hard. So those were underperformers, although the position sizes there were very small. Um, and then we have two holdings in Europe um, where I really underestimated the uh, sort of pessimism and, and dramatic nature uh, by which things would be sold off in the country, you know, some, somewhat for good reason. There's a lot of macro related issues going on. Um, and despite the strength of those businesses, their share prices kind of got hammered as people digested all the news. So um, it was a combination of things, you know, that, that didn't work well. But um, and, you know, of course, uh, without getting into specifics, I, I made my fair share of investment mistakes and, um, you know, starting to rethink utilizing very small position sizes as, as starters or way, ways to kind of feel things out um, just because it examining my own track record over the last few years uh, in, in light of those types of investments, it hasn't worked out very well. And there are reasons for that. But um, so some of our smaller positions didn't work. And then I had a few um, smaller investments where um, I kind of round trip them, like saw the writing on the wall. My spidey sense was tingling a little bit, you know, made it a small position, um, got what I wanted out of it and then foolishly held on to those things and kind of watched as the macro took hold again toward the end of the year that those were kind of declined as well. And some of which we no longer own. So a good combination of market related declines and macro stuff. And also, uh, also of course my own, you know, mistakes from a portfolio management standpoint. Absolutely. So we, you know, you brought up polished, you know, as, as one of the, uh, investments that, uh, caused you some, some, uh, some pain, I guess you say in 2022, uh, full disclosure, I'm not a shareholder in Polish, but you know, why, and you, you mentioned this in your, in your Q3 letter uh, last year. I mean, why, and you can get as specific as you want, or you can talk more, you know, more philosophically if you want on this, but I mean, why would you, why, why has that investment been as you, and I'm quoting here from you, uh, been one of the more frustrating investments you've ever made? Oh boy. Uh, so we could probably do an entire, um, an entire podcast on this alone and some of the issues surrounding the business. Um, as I mentioned, full disclosure, we still own our shares and I, I definitely, and unfortunately can't sing the company's praises right now, given the share price decline and some of the internal issues. Um, but as I wrote in my letter, I, I still believe that a positive outcome is achievable here. And just to take a, a step back, um, for those that, that aren't familiar, Polish.com is an e-commerce appliance retailer that was posting really strong operational results in a really tough macro environment all throughout 2020 and 2021. And prior to releasing their Q2 22 financials announced they were conducting an internal investigation into the business um, and claim along with claims made by former employees which delayed the filing of the financials, which still haven't been released. And the investigation um, has concluded and the results that were released seem pretty benign in my view. But during the process, their auditor resigned and they announced a small restatement for Q1 22, which affected revenues and operating income um, by very small percentages, which also obviously pushed up the filings by a few more months. Um, and without getting into I guess, further detail. Um, my expectation is that the file, they'll be current on their filings by Q1 of 23, and investors will finally get a chance to see how the business has fared over the last half month, half, uh, half year or so. Um, you know, the, the frustrating aspect, uh, first and foremost, has been 
the sort of pause in operational in really strong operational momentum. Um, like I said, the the company um, the company is one hundred percent is a pure play e commerce appliance retailer, and so they were able to and they have uh, very strong SEO capabilities and their logistics are really good historically and they were able to grow a lot faster than some of the larger appliance retailers like AJ Madison or even Lowe's and Home Depot, for example. Um, and they were doing that by taking market share. And I estimated that even in a situation where the macro got really bad or we entered into a recession, the appliance category actually holds up pretty well overall um, compared to other consumer discretionary categories or consumer durable categories. And so I thought, and we paid a ridiculously cheap price for our shares. And so I thought that um, at a high level, things would hold up pretty well, even if there was a slight downturn in demand for the industry overall. Um, and so that was really the frustrating part is, you know, Q2 of this of last year was really the, the quarter where I think if they posted strong results, the market was really going to start to recognize that this was something significant and wake up to the fact that this business was doing something a little bit different. Um, you know, growing, profitable, generating cash, strong balance sheet. Um, they initiated uh, the company's market cap at the time before Q2 was, I think, 140, 150 million. And they had announced and were ready to um, activate a $30 million share repurchase program, which would have been significantly accretive, given that the company was trading in a really low multiple. And so all those things were in place. That was really frustrating to see as everyone's kind of waiting with bated breath for the Q2 financials. Um, but the other frustrating part, obviously, throughout this whole process is really the lack of communication by the board and management team regarding some of the business's internal issues. And um, all, all of this is you know, out there in the public, and you can go to their site and read the press releases, so I don't have to get into all the details. But the communications that they have released, uh, most of it has been very vague and at times has raised more questions than they've answered, which is not what you want to do during this kind of this a period like this and while there are limits to the things that they can disclose um unfortunately they've shot themselves in the foot multiple times uh and again raised more questions than they've answered and so you know there's also frustration stemming from like the wording of the press releases and the lack of simple financial information that's been requested by people like myself and other shareholders um and where, where there's nothing stopping them from doing so and I've heard from others in the past, their communication with investors has not been great. So um, I haven't really sat through a situation like this before, at least since inception of the, of the firm. So it's been very frustrating. Um, you know, the positives are that they've taken steps in the right direction to clear sort of the low hanging fruit surrounding all these internal issues. Um, and they have addressed some concerns, you know, the investigation is behind them. And as I mentioned, the results and what came out in terms of what they were investigating was pretty benign, um, not only for the business itself, but in terms of what you usually see sometimes in micro cap plans. Um, and the CEO and CFO are now gone. They resigned. And the CEO actually, given what happened, given what they were investigating, actually footed the bill for the entire investigation. So they have a small cash infusion coming. Um, and a new auditor has been selected, and now their focus is on getting current with the filings, which um, my expectations are that they will be current by the end of Q1, you know, kind of holding my breath there or not holding my breath, but that's my expectation. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely one of the more frustrating investments that I've ever been a part of, but um, it's not, it's, I don't think it's, the story is quite quite over yet or the thesis is broken just yet, you know, I'll, I'll probably get roasted for that comment, but um, we we're operating on kind of incomplete information about the financials. So in my view, we kind of have to kind of have to wait at this point and, and uh, to get a, a glimpse into how the business is bearing. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there from just a general perspective when you're looking at potential investment and then just, you know, calling all management teams, like just communicate better. It's sad we even have to really say that, but but I get it too. You know, they have a lot of advisors, they have a lot of legal advisors that are telling them like, hey, just don't say anything or, you know, but what they'd also don't understand too sometimes is that like, hey, you know, there are forums or, you know, I'm not trying to like, you know, be self-serving here, you know, but like there's ways in which you can communicate what's been going on in a way that, 
you know, you could just answer some of these questions and not, you know, implicate yourself, I guess, in, in many respects. I don't know. It, it just, there's no excuse that, for not communicating what's going on. Well, yeah, I, I think it's well said, you, you know, you, you're the guy who has an amazing platform for these types of companies. And if you think that I haven't brought it up to them, um, yours and other, others um, specifically, I, I have, because it's really important to me. And um, I've been in communication with the board and management and IR very frequently, um, which is unfortunate. But this is one of those situations where um, I'm uh, impeded by my firm size, I'll just say. And at, at, uh, in, in the future, there would be um, an interest on my part um, to get involved from an activist standpoint and sort of right some wrongs here that, I, in my view, uh, could be done very easily. You know, there, going back to the thesis not being broken, I'm of the opinion that there's still value here. At 55-ish cents a share, the market cap is like 60 million or something. Uh, the business was set to do 40, almost 50 million in EBITDA this year. I'm sure that has since come down. Even a haircut to that is incredibly cheap. You know, they had the buyback in place. As far as we know, they're still generating cash. So um, don't, you know, don't take my word on that. Do your own work. But and so I, I think um, if somebody were to come along and look at this in a sort of rational way, now that some of these things are behind them, you know, two, three times EBITDA or, or whatever the price is, is probably not the right price to pay for this business. We'll see if I end up being right, but that's kind of what I'm tethered to at this stage. Absolutely. You know, I was just talking to Artem. Um, we published that episode. Uh, uh, it was, well, so we published that, I think, about a week ago. And we were talking about this idea of activism in microcaps a little bit, you know, because it's, it's interesting when you start thinking about the time and effort it takes when, and especially depending on the time period, right? You know, when everything is just rocketing upwards, maybe it makes a little bit more sense, you know, um, especially if it's a company that there's a lot of unrealized value, you know, what you can ask that question, why isn't this company, you know, all, you know, uh, also performing the way it maybe should be. And maybe there's something I can do here. But then when you're in, when we're in, you know, kind of a, a, a markets like we are right now, and especially in micro caps, where everything is more or less down um, or more or less, you know, there's a lot more hair than maybe usual, you know, not totally maybe the, some of these individual companies fault, you know, my, there's usually a lot of macro issues there too. But then you have to ask that question. It's like, well, there's other good quality businesses that are also trading at discounts or at 52 week lows or, you know, just, just other maybe potential interesting ideas. So it's like, do I, do I take, do I take that time and effort and, uh, and, and money to go and, and be more activist or is it worth just kind of, you know, just waiting for the next bus to come in? Do that. I'm sure you think about that all the time. Well, I listened to the episode. It was very good. I yeah. would love to be in on that conversation <laughs> uh, privately. But um, no, I mean, look, I, I know people who do it well, uh, microcap yeah. activism. It's Absolutely. necessary at times. You, you said something that was key there, which is hair on some of these companies. And anybody who's spent any time in microcaps knows that uh, you can find some very unique and crazy situations. Um, you know, it is necessary at times. And I think for Polished, the issues have been so unique and so business specific and that it's um, hard to paint that with a broad brush, like saying, oh, there's a lot of companies out there that fit this mold. But there's, you know, you also mentioned this, there's a lot of value. There's still value to be had there, in my opinion. And so the fact that when you sit there and watch a company kind of stumble over themselves or trip over their own feet over and over again, it starts to, you know, beg the question of like, we need to get some quote unquote adults in the room, as they say. Um, and so for this specific situation, I could see something like that adding a lot of value. Um, I've been asked this before too, you know, from potential clients, et cetera. Is that something you'd ever consider is going the activist route? Because I think people see the value there at times. Um, the answer I always say is yes. You know, I, I wouldn't take the sort of Dan Loeb, Carlo Canell approach where it's like you have to, nothing against them obviously, but you have to go in there and be kind of nasty. I think I'm, I would be a more sort of friendly and um, collaborative activist in that way, but 
you know, there are times when you have to press on the gas in another direction. So, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's something I'd really look forward to exploring down the road, but, um, and yeah, to answer your question, I think it's necessary in certain cases for, for sure. sure. Oh, for sure. And that, and listen, I wasn't saying, you know, it's just, it's been in that episode, we talked about how, like, do we think that there's going to be more or less of that, I think for 2023. And, and we, I think we both kind of looked at each other like, uh, maybe, I don't know. I, you know, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's a bad, you know, we were talking about that with M&A too. We were just like, could this, I mean, it, I mean, evaluations more or less stay the same. The companies are still performing, you know, you might, might see more of that right now. I don't know. It, it's, yeah. it, it should be interesting. Yeah, I always keep my eye out for it. So we'll see. Yeah. So, you know, another topic I wanted to get into with you, you know, as we mentioned, you know, listen, we're in January, we're still in reflection mode of 2022. Um, and maybe how to utilize some of whatever we learn in, in, in a tough year to move forward in 2023, whether it's a, a ends up being a good year or not. You know, for you, how have you been managing the mental and emotional side of things when you reflect on it and then moving forward? I think it's a really good question. And uh, my, my gym membership has gotten a lot, got a lot of use in 2022. And uh, my dog was probably wondering why we were taking such frequent walks. Uh, but other than that, I'm doing great. Um, no, but I think um, this is a really important part of my process. You know, I feel like sometimes I can't think straight without um, managing sort of the physical and mental side of things. Um, or I guess I'll just say physical, you know, it's really important for me at a high level to get enough sleep, to make sure I'm eating clean and to be exercising. And it just does something to my, um, the sort of flow of the week and my work uh, flow and work process where it just, I, I can think clear. I don't feel sluggish or weighed down. And um, I maybe can manage stress a little bit better, although I'm not sure how well I did that in 2022. Um, but I think, you know, any active manager, takes this job incredibly seriously and it feels terrible uh, when you're losing money. So I think it's really important to have mental um, outlets and stress relievers and ways to kind of step away from the screen at times, you know, work for some of us can even be like taking phone calls while walking outside or, um, you know, going to visit companies is a great way to get away from the screen or going to events um, such as, you know, playing a micro cap events. Uh, you know, changing up your work location. You were talking earlier how I utilized a co-working space for a portion of 2022, which was great just because it provided like a different energy than my home office. And I got to meet people in different fields and just, it was kind of like a mental refresh. And now, now I'm sitting in an office, a solo office, but it's in an office building above a hair salon and, um, you know, very different from being at home. And so that's really important. And um, we were also talking, I have a one and a half year old daughter now. And so that anytime I need to sort of step away, you know, it's um, she provides like the ultimate relief from work if I need it. So that's, that's been the, maybe the best thing about last year as we started to become a little bit of a per more of a person. But um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, there were a lot of scary headlines last year and predictions that were potentially scary. And I think during times like that, if you're adopting a long-term view, I think it's really important not to let your feelings or emotions or mentality at the time sort of force you out of positions based on some of those headlines or scary things that are happening in the world. Um, you know, I set out to implement a strategy years ago and I, I continue to do that when things are going well, but most importantly when they're not going well. And so I think that investing with a sort of value-based framework means that during periods of market downturns, you have, the ability to upgrade the portfolio and find bargains among our universe of attractive businesses. And during, you know, periods of rising markets, people will usually recognize the quality of what you own and we should do pretty well. So in that vein, I guess, sticking to the process becomes really, really important. And, you know, this is hard to say uh, after a, a significantly down year, but the sort of building blocks of investing, successful investing, don't really change from year to year for me, and that's sort of a mental reminder that I have to that I have to give myself during periods of stress. Um, you know, and, and a lot of journaling is done, of course, to um, to like reflect how I'm feeling and to go back and or to document how I'm feeling and to go back and reflect on that. Um, and so, you know, my you know, 
I guess the overarching thing is like if buying stocks when you can reasonably believe that in a few years, free cash flow and or earnings power will be higher than it is today, and you don't overpay for such things, is a pretty good recipe for good returns, whether things are going poorly or whether they're going well. So, so kind of sticking to that and you know tethering myself to those that framework keeps me calm, I think, during periods or relatively calm during periods of stress, if that makes sense. Without question. I, and thank you for that, for, for sharing all that. I mean, you know, look, I, I, it reminded me actually of a um, conversation I had with Ian, I, know, I think it was a couple of years ago. It was before, it was before 2020, I think, where we were talking about how, you know, everyone has done great in the last, you know, eight, nine years, 10 years, you know, bull, bull market run, you know, forever since the GFC. And I think it was him, I think it was him or somebody else, but maybe I've had this conversation a couple of times, but it's like, I we're really going to know the folks that are in really, cause I don't want to say good or bad investor because you know, look, you could be a good investor and still make a mistake. Right. Um, I think it was more just like, you'll, we'll know the ones that are really in it for the love of the game versus the ones that maybe were just in it for some short termism just to see how they survive during times like this you know, and having a strategy and just having a mindset to be able to, to, to get through that and, and knowing the tools, you know, um, that, that, that to me has always made a lot of sense when thinking about, especially as a micro cap investor, because usually those peaks and valleys are a bit more frequent than, you know, what maybe somebody who's looking at, you know, who's, you know, on S and P, you know, one of the ETF for, for eight, nine, 10 years. Right. Yeah, that's a gr- those are great points. And Ian, uh, I think Ian is like the micro cap Yoda. You know, I go to Twitter <laughs> For to like sure. get his inspirational quotes, and even the it's ones always a calming. It's always yeah, a calming yeah, event. exactly. <laughs> and even the ones where he's like, you know, talking about you really get to know yourself when something draws down. I'm just like, man, that's you know, I, I always enjoy reading his tweets. But you make some good points. I think um, there are some great investors who uh, had very difficult years last year and where some really great, some really outstanding long-term track records took a really big step back and including mine, I don't have a long-term track record yet, but in terms of figuring out who's good and that kind of thing, you know, um, the, you know, the magnitude at which the fed raised rates sh- shifted a lot of things very quickly. And so um, some people that were investing on the other side of that dynamic, like, you know, high growth, unprofitable, um, you know, SaaS or technology, et cetera, um, you know, struggled a little bit. And that's not judging anybody's process or types of investments, but um, it's e- just like it's easy to zoom in on um, a, a stock that's down a lot or a scary headline or a number of scary headlines and say, this, we should panic. This is how we, you know, things are going to be from here on out. It's very easy to take a bad year, you know, even a really bad year by somebody and blow that up and say, you know, they don't know what they're doing after 10 years of successful investing. I'm not sure that's true. I'm not necessarily in that camp, but it's easy to do that and to pile on to people who have struggled. And so, um, uh, and so, yeah, you saw a lot of that. And I think, you know, some people who aren't good or I guess not people, but funds who won't make it, you know, you may see that moving forward. Um, uh, And so I I don't know how, what the severity of that would be, but a year like last year, you know, definitely changes a lot. And you start to kind of, um, you're, you know, you're talking to somebody who launched a, a, a you know, strategy a few months before COVID and benefited from all of those tailwinds. And now I'm sitting here last year, you know, thinking like, you know, how, that I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, you get this feeling of like it, the last couple of years have just been luck. And now, the, you know, the chickens have come home to roost or whatever they say. And I'm, you know, going to be screwed from here on out you know i don't have to talk myself off the ledge a little bit in that respect but um yeah i know you know again i don't have a long-term track record and certainly not as good as some of the investors that you know i mentioned but um but yeah it's, it's uh it's definitely something to think about and last year provided a lot of uh opportunity for for soul searching i'll say that's for sure you know one thing i always i always like uh think about when it comes to uh investors especially you know i'm active on twitter you know you see some of the stuff that people put out there in terms of you know and it's it's interesting how the active investor community and i'm specifically talking the active investor community because 
you know, when you're passive investing, you don't need to think about, well, who am I as a person uh, to, you know, how do I like to invest in, you know, because if you're just investing in ETF, like you're like, all right, you know, ETF, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, what, I, no judge. I'm just saying it was fine. But like, yeah, yeah. When, but when you're an active stock picker, I love the, the self-exploration that you've been seeing amongst uh, most investors because you have to really reflect on, who you are as a person and doing all this stuff. It's just, I, I don't know. Sometimes I find it funny of like all the extra things that folks have to do in order to like get there. And listen, I'm saying this is somebody who's been in therapy for most of my life. Okay. <laughs> as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's still, it's still been quite fascinating to see, you know, everybody puts like some of the, you know, those jokes about like, uh, you know, on the on Twitter for 10 hours when they could have just gone to therapy for an hour and they would have been fine or something. Yeah. Know? Those are funny. Yeah, but like it's in, it's interesting just to see the the sort of self reflection on who you are as a person. And it's like you know sometimes you don't have to be so hard on yourself. You know sometimes you know what either you just made a mistake, and uh, or things were just out of your control. And just being able to accept that, right? Really well said. You know, it's funny um, uh, when I was working in basketball when we would evaluate really good uh, three point shooters. One of the most attractive characteristics that a shooter could have is what people call a quick delete button, which means when they miss a shot, they see the result of the shot, the miss, and it's out of their mind before they can even turn around and start running back down the court because that way they're ready for the next shot and basically set yourself up to not be worrying about what happened in the past. And while investing is a little bit different, it's not exactly apples to apples, I think for mistakes especially – there should be a, a long reflection period. You should analyze everything that went wrong. You should journal a lot about it and sort of do your pre and post mortems and see how those measured up. Um, but you also need to have that delete button. Like you have to remove those mistakes and move forward as best you can because it's going to s- sort of screw with your entire process if you hang on to the things that you did wrong. Or even if you know you, you think you're right on something and the market is just drawing down in general, it becomes really difficult to focus if you're kind of hung up on that. And so that's part of getting away from the screen. That's part of sticking to a process. But, um, and Twitter, you know, I guess I'm lucky in that sense because nobody ever talks about or debates the stocks that I own on Twitter because they're too small and off the beaten path and, and weird and boring. So I'm not, um, I'm not, I guess, privy to those. I don't know anything about those debates and they're, they're funny to see. Oh, no, for sure. And uh, listen, I bring all this up. I, I just started a, uh, Obstacles Away by uh, Ryan Holiday, and I've been reading up a bit on, uh, you know, stoicism and stuff like that. So it's been it, it's been it's been kind of interesting to actually pick it up around this time, you know, especially when reflecting on 2022. And you're right, analyzing your mistakes, seeing where you went wrong, making sure it's you know, I, I always I have my phrase noted, you know, so you can go back to it, and then but from there, all right, move forward, let's go, you know. Um, yeah, I agree. I, uh, that's, that book's been on my wish list, uh, my Amazon wish list for a while. So if you recommend it, I'll have to order it. Yeah, I got that. I just picked up that and, uh, and meditations, uh, by uh, Marcus Aurelius. I don't know. I just, I I wanted to listen. Hey, you'll find out very soon. Once you have two kids, the brain drain is extreme. (laughs) It's so extremely real. I, I, it's, it's, it's wild when, when you feel it. So, uh, all right. Well, I'll take your uh, take your advice on that. I'll get. I'll have to order uh, meditations too. Yeah, man, dude, you're well on your way already. At least you're already journal. You're already doing the things to kind of keep the mind active. Hey, as an active investor, you're definitely going to. You know, that's that's for sure. But um, change the topics a little bit. You know, one other thing I wanted to talk about uh, that we talked about a little bit offline. We're going back and forth on emails. Was about capital raising in this environment. You know. Uh, we're we're in the middle of just rebalancing our index right now. Actually, I just sent in the the rebalance, and the number one industry, and this is no surprise, but it was interesting only because of where we're at right now, was that almost every mining company on the that made our the index based on our criteria did a deal in some point in November or December, like they just. That, you know, I mean, price of gold is over 18. I don't know what it is today, but, you know, it's been consistently over 1800 for a while now. Um, and also healthcare deals have been, have been <laughs> getting done. You know, so there is, there are deals getting done. And you can think from, you know, just thinking out loud, like, okay, longer term plays, um, 
you know, uh, clinical trials might take another year, two years for them to play out or on the mining side, you know, for the mine to be built or whatever. Um, so they're like, okay, well, that doesn't seem, maybe we park it there on this riskier side because this is a two, three year play anyway, maybe that'll get us through where we're at right now. Um, but at the same time, not seeing a ton of deals happening in some of the other sectors. Um, so I, I don't know, curious to your take how difficult it is, and maybe some of the things that you're seeing. That was just some of the stuff I've seen. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I can talk about capital raising a little bit as it relates to like my strategy, if that, um, please, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, please do. Yeah, you know, obviously, obviously, just to touch on what you said at a high level, when rates go up, the cost of capital goes up, and when valuations compress, the cost of capital goes up because uh, you're, if you're using stock as currency for anything, obviously it becomes more expensive. And so companies that need to raise capital are kind of hit on all sides and capital intensive businesses, the same thing in a higher cost of capital and inflationary environment, just the math can get kind of rough. Um, I try to, I'm not sure how well of a job, how good of a job I'm doing at this, but I try to make sure that our businesses have at least some form of pricing power and can withstand some of these things. Although no one really knows how much it will affect, you know, a business uh, results over time, uh, things like inflation and rates. Um, but, and so that's a headwind, you know, to some businesses and you really want to be careful in terms of, I guess, how you're evaluating those types of companies. Typically I like the, you know, cleaner balance sheets, cash flow positive, um, self-funding, that kind of thing. And so it hasn't been a huge problem, you know, when rates started going up and realized the cost of capital was increasing, I didn't really panic. Um, the M and A strategy business that I mentioned is, I mean, the business model is funded and they generate a ton of cash. And so it's not an issue. Um, but yeah, so that's that's interesting on its own for sure. Um, and capital raising, you know, it's from my standpoint, I would say it's incredibly difficult in this environment, in any environment. And, you know, I'm certainly not the most experienced investor in this area. And it's, you know, I'm, I don't consider myself a strong marketer. Right now, I would say it's been really difficult Um as is usually the experience in a, in a bear market or a downturn or time of stress. And this particular period is more so because it's provided so much uncertainty. As I mentioned, we still haven't landed on, you know, a specific interest rate yet. Um, and I mentioned earlier too, the speed and magnitude at which the Fed raised rates this time around was really shocking to a lot of investors who kind of opted to flip their positioning or reduce their exposures considerably. So, you know, the phrase uh, raise money in a bull market remains very much intact uh, right now. And right now, I'd say, personally, I'm, I'm facing the hurdles of being an emerging manager, uh, being long only, and finding opportunities in small companies, which tend to be more volatile. Those aren't hurdles for me, but they can create some headwinds for, um, they make it a little bit, they make the strategy a little bit tough to swallow for people who might be interested in investing. Um, and so I would say probably three quarters of the way through the year last year, um, capital raising, you know, kind of dried up a bit as people sort of waited out the uncertainty and wanted to see how the year unfolded. And there's no, really no rush for, on anyone, from anyone's standpoint to invest in Greystone or a strategy like mine. Um, and so, yeah, it, it became difficult, but the, the thing that I kind of think is interesting, uh, which it is not just a problem unique to me is that um, the, the capital raising activity tends to be reduced at the exact period when an allocation to a strategy like mine should be very attractive given the current environment. Um, small caps are at historically cheap levels. Uh, and I think, you know, we can use periods like this to strengthen the portfolio and really set the stage for strong returns moving forward. Um, you know, all of that being said, uh, my distribution list now for my letters, et cetera, is, has grown to over 600 people. And, you know, I'm aware that probably like less than 10% of that, um, those readers are actually would be interested in a potential investment. Uh, but there are some very serious people on that list, which I really appreciate. And during the last year, even when things weren't going well, you know, I continue to plant a lot of seeds and have some really great conversations with allocators and family offices and high net worth 
individuals. So um, I'm kind of, you know, putting my shoulder down and moving forward and just what, what's the date today? The 12th, just in the last, you know, two weeks alone, I'm already seeing sort of an uptick in this activity again, where people are reaching back out and they're saying, you know, we spoke at this time, let's catch up. Let's talk about this, you know, send me your returns, that kind of thing. And so that's encouraging at, le uh, at the uh, very least, but um, yeah, and make no mistake. It's, um, it's been incredibly difficult in an environment like this and it may, you know, may continue into this year as well. Hey Amen. Just got to keep being that stone cutter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm pounding the rock every day. There you go. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're about there, you know, so I wanted to close out our interview today with talking about, uh, you know, your positioning heading into 23 and then maybe touch on some recent new positions that you've taken that demonstrate that mindset now in 2023 and beyond. Yeah. So um, I think the portfolio is pretty diverse. Um, as I sit here today, it holds almost all of what we owned um, exiting 2022 with, as I mentioned, some smaller positions that haven't worked out as well after sort of evaluating my own results in that area um, over the last couple of years. So we're a little bit more top heavy right now with some fat around the middle, I would say, in terms of our concentration. Um, my focus thus far has really been consumer related businesses. So we have a lot of those with really strong demand profiles and excellent unit economics on new growth. We own business services companies that have been somewhat insulated from the macro environment uh, over time and, and through COVID. And then some special situations with some near-term catalysts that seem to be uncorrelated with things like the broader economy. So overall, there's a pretty good combination of revenue and cash flow growth, uh, potential takeout candidates, and even balance sheet plays. And, you know, that's all, you know, part of my process, you know, again, whether things are going well or not. Um, Almost all of our positions were hit pretty hard during 2022, you know, as the market sort of digested what was taking place and all the negative news came through on what seemed like a weekly basis. Excuse me. Um, so where I sit today, you know, I don't really think the share price activity that we saw among some of our stuff is really justified based on the fundamentals. Um, and every one of our holdings performed really well during 2022. So my my view is that we're set up really well for a change in sentiment, you know, regardless of what happens over the next six to 12 months, I'd imagine our companies will grow their earnings power in 2023 and set themselves up to continue growing their earnings power during the next few years. Um, and look, I mean, you know, as you know, I, I run a long only strategy, so um, I'm not really concerned with, I guess, exposure levels or a short book. And although I'm surprised at how some of our businesses were affected in 2022, I feel as though, you know, sometimes we should be a little bit more insulated from broad market activity, uh, given what we own. It didn't really work like that last year, but um, we own zero names in the S&P, very few index names uh, at present, and um, in names with very low float, as I mentioned, that don't tend to sell off in line with the broader market. So I thought heading into last year, we would be okay, especially on the back of really strong fundamentals. Um, but again, it didn't necessarily work out that way. Um, so the strategy is not very defensive, but um, in light of how I'm positioned, you know, risk management is done kind of from the bottom up of this single security level, investing in situations where I feel like our downside is really well protected. Um, but unfortunately what happened last year, you know, when the liquidity rug kind of gets pulled out from under you, especially when it comes to small companies, you can get, you know, killed even if your businesses are performing. And that may happen again this year, but that's kind of the trade-off I'm willing to accept, especially again, if fundamentals keep improving uh, for our businesses and trending in the right direction. And as long as we didn't overpay for what we own. And so, um, you know, that's kind of how we're positioned uh, at a high level. And I, I'm aware of the idea that, you know, the cheap can get cheaper um, in the near term, but, um, yeah, the portfolio is a good, you know, in terms of new positions, the portfolio is a good combination of, you know, what I'd call maybe tra more traditional value investments. And then there's some growth related things. There's still a huge focus on cash flows and asset values. And as I was saying earlier, we probably own zero, you know, sexy or exciting businesses, but more boring, simple stuff. And that's somewhat intentional for a number of reasons, but especially because I really want to make sure I'm not taking 
any large sector bets or factor bets on one specific thing. As we talked about, we saw how poorly that worked out um, last year in a few areas, and I really want to try to avoid that. But there's a big focus on quality, you know, whether it's a core position, a uh, special situation, et cetera. Um, you know, I think I think quality is supposed to just cheapness in general is what's probably going to work moving forward. And so my my general mindset about 23 is however this year plays out, you know, if I can find and own really good businesses that can endure through economic ups and downs, they're run by really smart people. And those people know how to take advantage of those ups and downs, either by making the businesses stronger or um returning capital if they can when it makes sense to do so and again i don't overpay for those things you know meaning the market isn't pricing in isn't pricing those businesses as good businesses then we should do reasonably well over time um and so you know i'm adopting a careful mindset you know as we head into the year um while keeping in mind that we definitely might not be out of the storm yet in terms of market declines or or valuation compression let me know if that answers your question that very much did, man. And I, 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 I got no comment. That's uh, that was a great, great place to I think kind of close everything out. So, you know, Adam, with that, where can our audience go find more information on you? Follow me on social media, the whole bit. Get in touch with you. Uh, yeah. So my website, uh, www.graystonevalue.com. Uh, Graystone is spelled with an E G R E Y. Uh, that has all the information on it. Um, contacts, you read my letters, uh, what the firm is about, the strategy, et cetera. And then I'm on Twitter at, uh, at AKWILK, W-I-L-K. Um, and always love to chat with investors and reach out if you, you know, own something I own and, or have read some of my letters and think I'm wrong about something. Those are the best notes to get, you know, the, um, so I can kind of red team some of the things that I own. So yeah, feel free to, anyone's welcome to reach out anytime. And, um, that's where you can find me. Very cool. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining me here today, man. Really do appreciate it. And um, wishing everything, you know, goes well, all everything, all good things. And uh, let's not, let's not make it uh, four years in between the next, <laughs> yeah. next time we have you on the pod. All right. I agree. Yeah. Thank you very much again for having me. It's always uh, fun to chat with you and I appreciate the invite. Thanks, man. All right. Talk soon. Thanks. Take care. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast.